good to see everybody back in again, and uh, I guess I'm going to have to apologize to my television audience in that last program. I just ran out of time. And uh, we're going to keep right on going where we left off, so uh, you can be turning to 1 Timothy chapter 2, those of you in the studio audience, as well as those of you joining us on television. And uh, again, we always like to make it so plain that we're not underwritten by anyone. I'm not necessarily uh, promoting any one group. We just simply want to teach the Word, and uh, we just let the Lord be our supplier, and uh, He's the one that we have to be beholden to. And uh, so all we trust is that we can avoid error. We're human, of course, as we showed in that last half hour. Ran out of time and didn't realize it. But uh, as far as humanly possible, we're going to search the Scriptures and uh, bring out the truth as much as the Lord will permit us to do. Okay, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, and this is the verse that we were working on in our last half hour, and we're going to pick right up and keep going in this half hour. And that is verse 5, where Paul writes, There is one God, one mediator between... God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, which of course is what we were showing in that last half hour, how that God the Son became flesh, became the visible image of the invisible God, and has such, of course, went the way of the cross, purchased our redemption, and rose from the dead, ascended back to the Father's right hand. All right, now then to give another little perspective, we were just ready to look at 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Now, of course, the terminology is slightly different, but it's still the same setting. <clears throat> 1 John chapter 2, where John now writes, My little children, these things I write unto you, that you sin not, and if... See, it's conditional that if any man sin, and we know we will, we have an advocate. Now, like I said, that's a different term than mediator, but nevertheless, it, it fulfills the same role. But here we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And where is he? At the Father's right hand, see, interceding for us. All right, now you remember in the last half hour I told you I lost a verse, a reference, and couldn't bring it back. Well, now it has during break time. Come back with me now to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3, which is the only other place that Paul uses the word mediator other than in 1 Timothy. He does use it in the book of Hebrews, but that's a little bit different setting than uh, what Paul writes to us in the church age. But Galatians chapter 3, verse 19. Galatians chapter 3, verse 19. All got it? Galatians chapter 3, verse 19. Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions. Now you've got to stop and think. You've got to know your Bible. All the way from Adam at about 4,000 B.C. up until Moses, there was no written word of God. There was no law. And it was only based on men's conscience. So with the law, 1,500 B.C. and Adam at 4,000 B.C., that tells us there was 2,500 years that the human race did not have any written word of God. All right, so that's why Paul uses the term then that the law was added 2,500 years later. And so it was added because of the transgressions. In other words, mankind was just constantly going deeper and deeper into sin. That's why he had to destroy them at the flood. But even after the flood, it came on the same way. They just went deeper and deeper. And so then that's when he called out the little nation of Israel and to the nation of Israel gave the law so that there was absolutely no doubt about what was right and wrong. There was no question. So the law was added because of their sinful lifestyle 
and it was going to be in force until the seed should come, speaking of Christ, to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now, who was the mediator at that time? Well, Moses was. Moses was the one who stood between Israel and God. And so he was the mediator between those two parties. So the picture is, of course, that now it isn't Moses who is our mediator, it's Christ himself, the one who satisfied all the demands of the law, the one who finished the work of redemption, and so now he is fully capable to sit at the Father's right hand as our mediator. And what a comfort, see? We know that, even as John places it in his little letter, that if we sin, we have Jesus Christ the Righteous One as our advocate, or today we would say he's our attorney. He's pleading our case constantly. He is also the mediator between God and man when it comes to this whole idea of prayer. And uh, there again, i got to think for a moment. I think it's in Hebrews, isn't it? That we are come into the throne boldly. Yeah, Hebrews 4. Hebrews 4. And dropping down to verse 14, 15, and 16 because this is all on this same scenario of Jesus Christ, the Righteous One, who is our advocate, who is our mediator, and as such then we can go right into the presence of God, day or night. Doesn't matter when or where we are. We don't have to be in our prayer closet. You can be driving down the road and you can lift your heart in prayer. You can wake up in the middle of the night and flat on your back, you can pray. You don't have to be in a particular position or anything like that. And here it is, verse 14 of Hebrews 4, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. See how plain this is? And since that's the case, let us hold fast our profession. In other words, our faith. For we do not have a high priest who cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but he was in all points tempted or tested like we are, but whereas we fail, he did not. He was without sin. Now then, verse 16. Consequently, or therefore, let us come, what's the word? Boldly. We don't have to shrink. We don't have to think, oh, I'm coming into the presence of a holy God. No. We are now on that, on that plane as a redeemed, blood-bought individual that we can come boldly into the throne of grace, into heaven itself and that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. What a promise! We don't have to be worthy. We don't have to find someone who can plead our case. We have him. He is our mediator. He is our advocate. And he is ready. And he is willing because of his mercy. All right, now whenever it comes to his mercy, we have to go back to Exodus. Exodus. Like I told you, we're going to wear these books out today, aren't we? Exodus 33. Long time since we've used these. I don't think I've used them since we taught Romans chapter 11. <clears throat> Exodus chapter 33. And this is just shortly after Israel had made the golden calf. And if ever there was a reason for God to destroy the nation, it was then and there. Exodus 33, dropping down to verse 19. Exodus 33, verse 19. 
And like I said, this is shortly after the golden calf experience when uh, Moses was up in the mount. You all know it. And God could have destroyed the nation in an instant. But why didn't he? Well, here's the reason. Verse 19. And, uh, well, I guess I should read verse 18. And he, Moses, said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And he, the Lord, said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee. And now here it comes. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. How could God say something like that? Well, he's sovereign. He's sovereign. He doesn't have to make an excuse for doing anything. He can do whatever he wants. And if he determines he wants to pour out mercy and grace, he can do it. And that's where we are. It's because of his sovereign grace that we can come into the throne room boldly in any time of need. And we don't have to go through anybody else because he is there constantly. Well, I guess another verse I like to use that shows his worthiness, and uh, I'll do this more than once. I might have even done it in our last taping, but turn with me to Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5, which of course is a whole different setting. Here we have the Lord ready to take the scroll, in this case, which is the mortgage on the planet. We're ready to pour out the tribulation wrath of God. But all I want you to see is what makes Christ worthy of everything that he does. Roman, uh, Revelation chapter 5, verse 9. And they sang a new song. Got it? Revelation 5, verse 9. And they sang a new song. And look what they say in their singing. Thou, speaking of Christ, thou art, what's the next word? Worthy. See that? Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals, and that is, of course, to pour out the judgments of the tribulation that would be coming from it. Thou art worthy to open the seals. Now, here's why he's worthy. For thou wast slain, and you have redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. See, it wasn't that he did it for any one group of people. This is no longer just for Israel. But he went to the cross and shed his blood and rose from the dead to redeem the whole human race. And that's what we've been seeing for the last two, three programs now, that when he finished the work of the cross, the, pe the price of redemption was paid for every human being, none excluded. And they can all come in the same way, by faith plus nothing. And yet the vast majority of the world walks it underfoot. All right, now let's come back to 1 Timothy chapter 2. And goodness sakes, the next verse is just about as loaded. But I'm not going to take another two programs for it. But the same concept. What did Christ accomplish with his death, burial, and resurrection? Verse 6, 1 Timothy chapter 2. Not only is he the mediator between us and God, not only is he the one who advocates on our behalf, but now there's another idea. He gave himself a ransom for all, not for a few, but for all, and to be testified in due time. Now think about that for a minute. It's been a long time since we've had a famous kidnapping episode like the Lindberghs, which I remember when I was just a little kid. But you all remember the, the Lindbergh ex uh, experience and how that a kidnapper will hold a child for ransom, 
pay the money and you can have the child. Well, the word means the same thing here. Christ paid the ransom. Not just for one child, but for every human being that has ever lived. And what was the price? Beyond human comprehension. The ransom that Christ paid with his death, burial, and resurrection is beyond human understanding. But he paid it. And how did he pay it? With his shed blood. All right, you're in, Timothy. Come on back to the right again to Peter's little epistles. Hebrews, James, and Peter. 1 Peter, chapter 1. And here's the ransom. This is the price that he paid. 1 Peter, chapter 1, dropping down to verse 18 and 19. 1 Peter, chapter 1, verse 18 and 19. For as much, Peter writes, as you know that you were not redeemed. See, a ransom price. You were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. Now, Peter, of course, is writing primarily to Jewish people. And so he's referring to their heritage as the nation of Israel under the law. But, verse 19, this was the ransom price, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained. Now that should take your mind right back to that verse we read in Acts chapter 2. Remember that it was foreordained way before anything was ever created that Christ would go to the cross. All right, and so now back to 1 Timothy again. Maybe we can make another verse or two before the afternoon is over. And he paid the ransom, not just for the few, but for the whole human race. And if I don't get anything across any more this afternoon than that, I'll have accomplished something that he didn't just pay redemption for a few, he paid it for the whole human race. And when you see the mass of humanity walking it underfoot, chasing other gods and other religions, or no concern whatsoever, what a travesty to think that he has paid for every one of them, and yet they pay no mind. All right, back to the text. Verse 7, whereunto, in other words, the fact that Christ had paid the ransom, the fact that Christ is our mediator between God and men, whereunto, Paul says, I am ordained a preacher and an apostle. I speak the truth, not a lie, but Paul is speaking the truth in Christ, a teacher of the Gentiles in truth and verity. Now, a lot of people, and I've mentioned this on the program more than once, a lot of people don't even give Paul the time of day. They will not even look at his letters. In fact, I shared with one of my classes here in Oklahoma just the other night, my goodness, of all the mail that I get of books and so forth. I'm just about ready to put out notice. I don't want any of this unsolicited material because I haven't got time to read it anyway. But all I have to do is just skim through it. And the first thing I notice, it's just so glaringly obvious, not one reference between Romans and Philemon or even the book of Hebrews. Not one. They'll quote everything from the Old Testament. Sometimes it's just sheets of paper with references trying to disagree with me. And all they quote are the Old Testament and the Gospels and the early Acts and Revelation. And they absolutely will not touch the letters of Paul. Well, when I see that, if they're listening, I don't care. They go in the wastebasket. 
Because if they are not going to pay heed to what Paul has written, they're out in left field anyway. Why should I waste my time? But see, Paul is the apostle of the Gentiles. He is the vehicle through which you and I have received these doctrines of grace. All right, just to make it real plain and simple again, we're going to go back to the book of Acts. Book of Acts, chapter 9. You want to remember that for the first seven chapters, it's all Israel. Peter and the 11, Acts chapter 9, honey, I think I'll go down to, uh, oh, let's go down to verse 15, I guess. But you remember in the first seven chapters, it's Peter and the 11, and then finally Stephen in chapter 7, appealing to the nation of Israel to repent of the fact that they had crucified their promised Messiah. But they would not. And I always call the stoning of Stephen in Acts chapter 7 and as the epitome or the crescendo of Israel's rejection. And they literally screamed at Stephen as they were stoning him. We'll not have Jesus of Nazareth over us. Well, then in chapter 8, you find that Peter, again, is, uh, is still in the limelight. And then when you get to chapter 9, we're introduced to the next character on the stage of history, biblically speaking, Saul of Tarsus. All right, and Saul, as you well remember, was on his way to Damascus to arrest Jewish believers that Jesus was the Christ. And the Lord struck him outside the city. And while he's picking up his pieces and uh, fumbling in his blindness and coming back into the city, God leaps ahead into the city and he approaches another Jew, Ananias. All right, and this is where we're going to pick it up. The Lord is now speaking to Ananias in the city of Damascus concerning this Saul of Tarsus. All right, and I said verse 15. Ananias, of course, has been more or less arguing with the Lord. Now, wait a minute. I don't want anything to do with this Saul of Tarsus. I've heard of all that he's been doing to the believers, and that's why he's here. But now look what the Lord says. Verse 15. The Lord said unto him, Ananias, go thy way, for he, Saul of Tarsus, is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the what? Gentiles. This has never been whispered before. Never. The Lord in his earthly ministry told the twelve, go not into the way of a Gentile or into the house of Samaritan, but go only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And God could not go to the Gentiles until Israel had full opportunity of bringing him in as their king. But they would not. All right. So now, after almost seven years of appealing to the nation of Israel to repent of having crucified their Messiah, and they will not, God now does something totally different. And he reaches down outside a Gentile city, not inside the land of Israel, but on Gentile ground, and he saves this renegade, this religious zealot, who was trying to stamp out the name of Jesus from the Jewish nation. All right, and so to that man now, the Lord is going to turn, and he's promising him that he's going to suffer for his name's sake. All right, now then, Paul makes such a, a clear definition of all this in the little book of Galatians how that he is to become the apostle and the teacher of the Gentiles. And that's what we're trying to show here now, that is, it wasn't just a statement of braggadocia. He's not claiming something that wasn't true, but indeed he is the chosen vessel by the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to now go to those hated, wicked, pagan Gentiles. All right, Galatians, uh, did I say chapter 2, honey? Chapter 1, I'm sorry. Chapter 1, where Paul lays it out so clearly of what took place. Verse 11. Well, I'll do this quickly. we only got a couple minutes left or I'll run out of time again. 
Verse 11, But I certify or guarantee you, brethren, that the gospel which is preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it. But where did he get it? From Jesus Christ. Now I'm always pointing out when I teach Paul's apostleship, Remember that everything in the gospel accounts was Christ before the cross, except, of course, for the account of the crucifixion. But his whole three years of earthly ministry are to the nation of Israel under the law before his death, burial, and resurrection. This man, this man gets all of his revelations from the ascended Lord, who is now up there at the right hand of the Father, and so this is what he says, I got it by the revelation of Jesus Christ. And then he comes on down to verse 15, When it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, unmerited favor, to reveal his Son in me, that I might preach him where? Among the heathen, among the Gentiles. And so he says, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. What does that tell you? He didn't run back down to Jerusalem and ask the twelve to fill him in, but instead he went the other direction into Arabia, whereupon we feel he received a goodly portion of these new revelations that nothing else in Scripture had ever revealed. And what was it? that when Christ died, <clears throat> shed his blood, and rose from the dead, he now could pour out saving grace, not just to Israel, but to the whole human race. And that's what we've been stressing all afternoon, that when Christ died, he died for all. That when he rose in resurrection power, he defeated everything that was against us, and he became our mediator, he became our advocate, he became our Lord, our master, and as we've seen just a moment ago, and it was all because of what he accomplished in that death, burial, and resurrection. <coughs> Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Felding. 